You believe in soul winning? Amen. Careful saying amen right there. You know I'm going tonight with a sermon, don't you? I'm going to ask you to go soul winning. I'm going to challenge you to go soul winning. I'm going to show you from God's word why soul winning is what we're supposed to be doing. All right? That's what this service is about tonight. And at the end, I'll tell you where I'm going now. So if you don't like it, you might as well get up right now and leave. I'm going to ask you right now, uh, by the end of the service, to commit to go soul winning. All right? Every week, have a weekly time from this week until Open House Sunday. All right? That week, Open House Sunday. Fair enough. That's where I'm going with this. And to carry tracks with you. That's where I'm going. All right, so if you're right now saying, you know, Pastor, I'm not going soul winning uh, those weeks. I'm not going to commit. Then you can click out, fall asleep, no big deal. You'll have to answer to the Lord for it. You know the Lord's about soul winning? Did you know that? Jesus said, I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's about winning souls. All right, Jesus is about the harvest. That ought to be what we ought to be about here at First Baptist Church. But I'm getting ahead of myself right now. I have to pass out this pad, which I forgot this morning to do. My apologies. And James, you're on the end, buddy, so you get last of the night. And it's a pink pad tonight for a bridal shower for Miss Kaylin Cowling. And she's marrying Brother Blake Rupel. Kaylin serving down in Tennessee and Knoxville. I'm sorry, in Sevierville area, and then Blake is in Oklahoma City serving, and they're going to go serve there in Oklahoma City, helping a church. Uh, Blake's assistant pastor, youth pastor there, and so they get married here and then head off, and Blake's already there serving. So they're going to be a great young couple as they serve God. You can come to that bridal shower, please sign up. But open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, one of the greatest soul winning passages in all of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Or it will be by the time we get done, I believe, all right? A tremendous passage perspective for us. Why soul winning? What's the purpose of soul winning? So we can put numbers on a board, so we can do something else with our time, so we can print gospel tracts here at First Baptist Church? Is that the purpose of soul winning? Why does it matter? Of course, Pastor Howell, of course it matters. It's because we want to see people saved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that why we go soul winning? Yes or no? We want them to see them touched by Jesus? Yes or no? Yes. Do you want to see people touched by Jesus Christ? You do, don't you? How many know someone somewhere that needs Jesus Christ? Someone somewhere. It's a pretty broad question, right? Put your hands down. How many know someone who needs Jesus Christ that they occasionally see. All right? How many could imagine that in the city of Saginaw, there could be people who need the touch of Jesus Christ on their life? We could imagine that there could be someone who needs the touch of Jesus Christ, right? If you want more clarification on that, just turn on the news. And you will find out that there are people in Saginaw, believe it or not, in the city not too far from us, within five or six miles of this place right here, who could be touched and helped by the touch of Jesus Christ. Snowflakes are frail, are they not? But if you put enough of them together, they can stop traffic. You may not be much by yourself, but with the power of Jesus Christ, you can stop traffic. We're looking forward tonight to looking at the power of the gospel. It's extraordinary. First Corinthians chapter number 3, we come across a church, the Corinthians church, the Corinthian church. They're not doing so hot. They've, their church, they've been meeting regularly. They've been, we find out in the book of Corinthians, they've been um, uh, observing the Lord's Supper regularly. Uh, they've been uh, doing some things there. But we come to chapter 3, and Paul has to write a letter to the church at Corinth because they've had some problems inside of the church. And he gives them some directives about these problems. In verse number 5, we'll start at verse number 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now understand what he's saying. He's not saying that they are babes in Christ, that they're just newly saved, but he had to speak to them like they were babes in Christ. There's a difference there. Right? He's not saying that they were just saved, but that they were acting like they were just saved. See the difference there? The difference between someone who is just saved and someone now five years down the road who acts like they just got saved. Right? There's a problem with that. Hopefully, like we talked about, hopefully that, that my child, when he's born, that Johnny has now acts different than the first day he was saved, or the first day he was born. In fact, the first day he was born, uh, I believe he threw a temper tantrum, as does my mother. 
All right, we, he was born, and it was a, quite an ordeal, I guess. I guess having a baby's a big deal or something. I don't know. And, uh, and uh, he was with Doreen, and then so we took him away so we could hold, you know, my, my child. And I held him, and my mom held him. When my mom held him, Johnny tightened up his little fists, all right, like this. His face got all red, and he began to scream. All right, now babies cry a different way, right, parents? There's sometimes, you know, when they're flat-out angry, and Johnny was flat-out angry that we had taken him away from his mother. And ever since, every time he leaves mom, goes to school, he gets his little fist like this and he just screams. Ah. But if Johnny still did that at 15, <laughs> well, never mind, okay, let's go. Okay, I have to know. We'd say, well, wait a second, buddy. There's a problem. You're not a baby, but you're acting like a baby. All right, and that's what Paul is saying. He goes, I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but that was his intended desire as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. I love a good steak, I love a good meal. After I had my wisdom teeth out, I could not eat meat. All right after my wisdom teeth are taken out. What a terrible day in my life. When I first had my braces on, I was 26 when I got braces on my mouth. It was a terrible day because I couldn't bite anything very firm. So I could have like ramen, welcome back to college days, and soup, welcome back to wisdom teeth days. It's not a great place to be, and that's what Paul is saying. I, I want to give you some meat of the word, but I, but I can't. I've got to give you some milk. Verse number three, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase." So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for this passage, for this time, Lord, and for this church. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to give the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us tonight. Lord, are there those who are here who need to be challenged afresh with giving the gospel and soul wing, I pray that you would challenge and touch their hearts. Lord, may we not make excuses, but may we follow you and your will, Lord, and your intent and your desire. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. There are times in soul winning messages that you could just give a lot of good stories, and the stories are amazing and plentiful, are they not? You love hearing about how someone's touched by the gospel and the way that God just miraculously works the gospel. It was great to hear from Brother Ramus, Eric Ramus, on Wednesday night about how he was saved through the bus ministry. Wasn't that great? And now his mom now teaches in the bus ministry, and I think his dad drives a, a, a bus, right? You say, yes, that's what happens, okay? You hear that and you say, that's amazing. Now someone's saved through the bus ministry, back in the bus ministry. Praise God for that. We could fill the time and more than this night with soul winning stories. But I want you tonight to not challenge us just by some stories, but challenge us through the truth from God's Word. See, a story can have an emotional effect, but God's Word will have a life-changing effect. This passage, I notice a few things that Paul challenges and convicts the Corinthian church worth with. First of all, I see the carnality of the church. Paul says that. He goes, you are all carnal. You are arguing instead of laboring. There is division instead of direction. There is always occasion for carnality at church. Carnal being fleshly and human. It is always opposite of spiritual. And Paul was saying to the Corinthian church, he said, listen, you're supposed to be spiritual, but instead of being spiritual, you are living in your flesh. 
Now we always seem to condemn others' flesh over our flesh. I can't believe their nasty attitude. Do you hear yourself? I'm not better. They should have done me better. They probably should have. We always forgive uh, our flesh over someone else's flesh. There's always occasion for carnality at church. Uh, I'm too tired. I'm too old. I'm too busy. In this particular case, it was among divisions, about divisions. I'm more important than you are. I'm of Paul. Paul is my spiritual father. There was another group that said, no, 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 not Paul, but uh, Apollos. Now, Apollos uh, was um, a great orator, master speech giver. Could just apparently twist words together in wonderful ways. And another group of men said, and, and women said, no, we're not of Paul, we're of Apollos. We're more important than you because Apollos is better than Paul. You know what happens today as well? In different ways in churches, and, and sometimes churches it's, it's more about uh, where they're from or, or what they're doing. Sometimes it's by section. Well, I'm of the right section, the left section, the middle section. I don't talk to people in the other section. Don't, see, I don't think I don't see that. Wouldn't it be a shame if a visitor did not get greeted because they sat in the wrong section at First Baptist Church? And you can't walk yourself over 15 feet? You know what that is? Carnality. I'm not in that section. Someone else will get it. Listen, that's the same thing right there in the Scripture. Same thing. Can't make yourself over, walk over there. Oh, I, 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 I can't introduce myself to that new person because maybe, maybe they've been here for a while and then they'll be offended. It could happen. You go up to somebody and say, hey, welcome to First Baptist Church. Oh, I've been here for, for six months. Okay. Oops. My bad. Sorry I didn't meet you before. Right? What's the worst thing that happens then? I'll tell you, you look foolish. Have you ever looked foolish before? Will you ever look foolish again? Yes, we all will. Remember, I tripped up the steps. It'll happen again. I usually get a running start on the steps. I like to run up those steps. You say, why do you do that? Just so I can show that I can still run up the steps. There'll be a time in my life I can't run up the steps, so now I will while I can. That's really why I do it. All right, and second part, I'm excited to get up here and preach. I look forward to it, all right? It's a great church. But it's carnality. We're, we're doing the same thing. We look at them and say, well, you're saying Paul and Apollos. That's different. No. No, there's divisions, and there shouldn't be divisions at church. There shouldn't be divisions. Paul calls it carnality or life in the flesh. You know, churches do it too. Well, I like... I like this place. I like the sword of the Lord. A place I like Lancaster Baptist and West Coast College. I like Pensacola. I like Crown College. And they all just fight back and forth, right? People do that. They, I like this college. I like that college. And you know what? It, it's silly. It's silly. But you know, sometimes you do it with sports too. Oh, that's community. We don't like them because they share the gospel. No, because they're dirty when they play basketball. Right. right. Like our boys have never fouled anybody else. Oh. Men's softball leagues? Is that further the gospel of Jesus Christ? Now I'm running on Rich Trogan's parade over there. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying we're stopping men's softball, but we allow that to cause division. That's carnality. That's what the Bible says. Listen, we're trying to obey the Bible. I'm trying to love God, please God, and serve God. I want you to love God, please God, and serve God. And, and the fact is, sometimes sports have a problem in, in the Christian school, and we try to, to work through that. Players have a problem, but sometimes parents have a bigger problem than the players do. It's carnality. Say, Pastor, you got way off track of soul winning. I'll come back around, don't worry. It's a, it's a, it's a good sidetrack right here. I tell you what, I was so glad at the youth conference yesterday that Pastor Jeff Hawes, youth pastor at Community Baptist, was here. He's a good friend of mine. 
Pastor Del Turpin, he's a new pastor at Junietta uh, Baptist Church. He was here. He brought some coffee. He has a, a coffee roaster thing. It's uh, like based on 1 Corinthians 10.31. It's like 10.31 roasters. They do great coffee. He brought some to give to all the, the sponsors who came for free. Like We brewed that for him. From Junietta. Can you believe that? It's almost like they're saved over there. Amen? <laughs> some folks from Beth Haven here as well. What a blessing. Good friend of mine, Pastor Jason Georges, he's a pastor at Emmanuel of Corona. It's a good thing. And the fact is, you could go to any other one of those good churches. They're good churches. And if you sat through the services, you wouldn't be lost. All right, you'd know what was going on. You'd hear about the same song that were sung, wouldn't you? About the same order of service. Maybe the offering would be a little different spot or something like that, announcements. The guy would get up to preach and you wouldn't be like, ooh, what's happening now? you would be like, oh, it's time for the sermon. You'd get out about the same time. You, you would know when to show up without looking at the website because you'd know about when they'd have service, right? They're very, they're not the enemy. And yet carnality creeps in. The flesh creeps in. And we're too busy bickering and not busy serving. We're too busy bickering, we're not busy serving. This spring we're going to we're going to have some girls' soccer with some girls' soccer scrimmages. Girls looking forward to it. Run around a little bit, knock some people over. All in good, in good fun. But, but listen, if that caused a big problem, I'd cancel it. You say, would you really, Pastor Howell? You love soccer. I do love soccer. But if you think I wouldn't cancel it, you don't know me. You don't know me at all. I have, I have sat my own brother at a conference soccer game lost the game because of his attitude i'm willing to lose to please the lord so don't think i won't cancel something all right to please god you don't know me they were arguing about who how they got saved and who gets the credit instead of giving the gospel to other people so they could get saved the point is this the carnality was that no matter what stops you if you're stopped from giving the gospel regularly you're carnal we can look at them and say, oh, they're bickering, that's terrible. I'm just busy. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know busy was the exception. Let me look here. Well, that's right. It's not. Well, they were bickering. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just quiet. I'm not. Pastor, I can't speak out like you do. You, you seem to just, you can talk forever long you want to, whenever you want to. You never shut up. Right? Probably true. <laughs> Brother Joe, I'm glad you're awake still, sir. <laughs> That's longer than normal. <laughs> Only about now your wife elbows you. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> nah, but I'm, I'm too quiet. I'm too quiet. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that you had to have the gift of gab to go soul winning. Oh, wait, you don't. You see, if we're not going out to give the gospel, we're carnal. We're fleshly. We're not spiritual. And no matter how you mask it, the problem is still the same. Something has hindered the process. Paul then gets to break down uh, this, this process. Paul knows this. They that know God will be humble, and they that know themselves cannot be proud. And Paul, after the carnality, gives a clarification to us. Paul gives a clarification. Paul says this. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul said, I planted Apollos. He just watered what was planted, but God gave the increase. Increase in souls, increase in sanctification. The fact is, here at First Baptist Church, we desire increase. We do. We hope that more people come and get touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's increase. All right? I'd love to, to fill up every single spot in this auditorium Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That's increase, right? We, we, you folks who work on a bus route, you'd love to see a full bus rather than an empty bus, right? In Sunday school classes, you'd rather have a full class over an empty class. I'd rather pack out the choir. We, we want to see an increase at First Baptist Church. 
And that's a good thing. That's a desirable thing. That's a spiritual thing. All right, I don't believe that, that God's desire is that the church keep on getting smaller. I believe that God's desire that the church keeps on getting bigger. In fact, Jesus said the fields are white unto harvest. All right, that's increase. All right, and, and, and the problem is not the harvesting, it's the laborers. You pray ye therefore the Lord of harvest that he will send forth laborers for increase. We want increase, but God does the increasing. We could, but we won't, do a false increase. There are ways to just get people into church. Free beer. Think that would do it? I think it would. Just to find out what you would come just to find out what was happening. Give a thousand dollars a person. Would that work? Would you come if I gave you a thousand bucks Wednesday night at church? Careful. I'm going somewhere with this. You be careful. Don't say yes too quickly. Because you won't do it for Jesus, but you do it for a thousand bucks? Is that what Jesus is worth? Less than a thousand bucks to you? A thousand bucks should come, but less than a thousand ain't worth it. I told you, be careful. Whew. You see, we could, we could do an increase just for increase sake. But it would be fake, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be, wouldn't be authentic. It wouldn't be genuine now, would it? It wouldn't be organic. It would, be, it, would be, it would smack of fakeness. It would smack of fleshiness and carnality. We'd be like, this just doesn't sit right. The so pastor, you, you just brought people in to give them beer just to get people here. That doesn't, it doesn't line up in my mind, pastor. Just give them a thousand bucks. I mean, I mean, thanks for a thousand bucks. We'll spend it, but, but uh, it, just, it just seems not right. Kind of like fake flowers, right? They look pretty, don't they? They look pretty, but they don't do much in life. They're decoration. That's all they are. They're eye candy. That's it. I, I plant these in the ground outside and they won't help my soil at all. There's no benefit besides eye candy. These don't make this room smell any better or any worse. They're just plastic and fake. And they'll always look the same. They always have a plastered smile on their face. I'm flowers. I'm a fake flower. And they're really not good for much, except for decoration. Honey, I love you so much, I bought you some fake roses. Said no one after an argument. <laughs> You're in the hospital, get well soon. Here's a, a fake flower. I, I would do that, all right, as a joke, but there's no benefit to them. Jesus didn't say, consider the fake lilies, right? There's not really any benefit to fake flowers, and there's not really any benefit to fake increase. They'll talk in other countries about what they call rice churches, in underdeveloped countries, sometimes third world countries, where they'll give rice to people if they'll come to church, and they'll build these massive, massive ministries because people are starving. And they'll come for the bag of rice. And wouldn't you know it, once the rice spigot gets turned off, the church is empty. You don't come to church because you get rice. You don't come to church because you have a thousand bucks. You come to church because you love Jesus. At least that's why you ought to come. Love God, please God, and serve God. And that's why, or this is why First Baptist Church, when we transitioned, or you didn't come for Pastor Alette, and hopefully you're not coming for me, you're coming for Jesus. Because right. Right, that's what's right, right. That's authentic, that's genuine. That's what we want to see. And so Paul gives us a clarification about the process. You know, the problem is we brag about the increase. Well, that's the people saved out there. That's increase. That's God's job. All I can do is plant and water. Now, I'm, I, I love hearing about salvation. Don't get me wrong. But the increase comes from him. If folks come to church, it's increased from him. 
Folks are touched with the gospel, it's increased from him. That's what God does. We only plant, we only water. The cause, we are God's building. We're supposed to build on that. Verse number 9, we're labors together with God. You're God's husbandry and you're God's building. But lastly tonight, I want you to see the credit in verse number 8. Here's what I'm going to challenge you tonight. So Paul talks about the increase, talks about the carnality, and then lastly talks about, right in the middle there, the credit. There is a thought process out there that because God does the increasing, it's all God's work, his, his responsibility, and it doesn't really matter what I do. It doesn't matter if I go soul winning or not. As long as someone goes, God will get the gospel of that person. It doesn't matter if, if, you know, if I don't make it this week, not a big deal. And Paul defeats that thought process in verse number 8. Would you look there with me? He says, he says Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own, what's the last word? Labor. You know what labor is? Work. Work. That means sometimes when you work, you may get sweaty, hot, cold, sore, tired, busy. You ever not want to go to work? You ever despise Monday mornings? You ever despise Tuesday mornings, Wednesday mornings, Thursday mornings, Friday mornings? You name the morning. We've all who've had a job have been there. <coughs> you wake up and you don't want to go to work. But you still do because you need the reward from your labor, which is the paycheck. Because you like your bed and because you want to stock up on toilet paper to defeat the coronavirus, you go to work. And Paul says, understand something, church. Carnal church to Corinthians. He says, understand something. You will first of all be judged by your own labor. You won't be judged by my labor. And I won't be judged by your labor. You won't be judged by your kid's labor or your spouse's labor or the church's labor. You will be judged by your own labor. And it's judged by the perfect judge, Jesus Christ, who sees and knows everything. And that's good and bad. Sometimes we use it in a negative sense. Be careful, Jesus is watching you. You know, what would Jesus do? He's watching you all the time, and that is true. But there's also the positive sense. Because when you're there, you're all giving the gospel. And no one else is around. You ain't doing it for no one but Jesus. He sees you. He sees you. When you slip a track to your coworker and no one else sees you, he sees you. You see, you're judged by your own labor, not my labor, not by another's labor, but our own labor. And we get credit for our own labor. This is amazing. Paul says, I plant, and Apollo's watered, and, and they're one. Whoever planted, whoever watered, it's one. He said it's the same thing. Whether you plant or you water, we're all in this together. But God gives the increase, and he says if you do this and God increases it, he'll bless you just for being a part of a process that you really have no control over at all. God is so good to us. I answer for my labor, but I have credit to God for the fruit. A dad took his six-year-old son fishing. They put down a line and went up to the cabin. After an hour, they went back to the river to see if they'd caught anything, and sure enough, there were several fish on the line. The son said, I knew there would be, Daddy. Father asked, how did you know? The son replied, because I prayed about it. So they baited the hooks, put them out again, went back to the cabin for supper. Sure enough, when they came back to the lines, the boy said, I knew it. The father, how did you know? The boy said, because I prayed again, he said. So once again, after supper, they put the lines back in the water, went to the cabin. Before bed, they went down the river one more time, but this time there were no fish. And the boy said, I knew there'd be no fish. The father said, well, how did you know? He said, because I didn't pray this time. And why didn't you pray, son? Because I remembered we forgot to bait the hooks. See, God does not promise to bait the hooks for us. That's our responsibility. 
That's our labor. We bait the hook and ask God to reel them in. Fishers of men. Can you imagine that day when God called out his disciples? Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Can you imagine the confusion in their minds? You know, Peter, what's a fisher of men? I, I, can we throw a net around these guys? Because uh, that's all they knew. They knew fishers of fish. And Jesus began to teach them fishers of men. We can only bait the hook. God gives the increase. Fact is, we have the same amount of time. We all do. Some have jobs, some are retired, some are in school. We all have responsibilities. But we all have a responsibility from Jesus Christ, and that is to give the gospel to those around us, to a lost and dying world. It is not just a pastoral responsibility, though it is my responsibility as well. It is not just my family, though they have the responsibility because they're Christians. It is not just a staff responsibility, though we ask them to go soul winning each week. It's not just a deacon responsibility, though we ask them to go soul winning. It is every Christian's responsibility. And yet sometimes we're Christians, but we're not getting the job done. There's a man who was a sports writer. A sports writer, he said, uh, he said, I'm no fan of watching baseball on TV. A few years back, 2012 I think it was, he watched base, a baseball game between the Oakland Athletics and the New York Yankees division series. He watched every pitch from the first to last with a stopwatch and a piece of paper. End of the game, the Yankees won 4-0. to zero. And he recounts the game, the time of actual play. The time of the entire A's-Yankees game was three hours and 15 minutes long. Time the baseball was actually in play, including pitches, batted balls, foul balls, pickoff attempts, relays, throws to bases, and anything else that might consider even a sporting activity, 12 minutes, 22 seconds. Percentage of time that the baseball game was on where there was no ball in play was 94%. He finished it with, times I plan on watching baseball on TV ever again, zero. I challenge us, times we are a Christian, if you're saved at four. I even saved a Christian for 20 years, 28 years, 30 years, two years. Time we claim to love Christ. Time actually spent in laboring for Christ. I'm afraid the number may be very, very small. See, Paul says, you're fighting when you should be laboring. You're carnal when you should be serving. I'm going to challenge us in just a moment to commit to go soul winning every week from now until open house. Sunday, I think it's May the 17th, I think it is. So, Pastor Child, that's a big commitment. Well, it's actually less than what Jesus asked of us. It really is. See, well, Pastor, I, I'm afraid to commit. I'm sure glad that Jesus wasn't afraid to commit to the cross. If you got all the way there and said, you know what, I just can't go through with this thing. I don't like the commitment to it. That song, I wonder have I done my best for Jesus when he's done so much for me. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would touch each and every one of the hearts in this room, Lord. Lord, I don't ask that so that we see an increase because, Lord, the increase is up to you. Lord, I ask that so that we can be spiritual and we can in some small way serve you who has given so much for us. Lord, would you help us to be obedient and honest to you? With the heads bowed and eyes closed, in just a minute, we're going to have an invitation.
At that time, there should be some commitment cards up front here that we can put out and some pens. And I'd like you, if you're willing to commit to go soul winning, to put it out there. Right, to go ahead and fill out your name on a piece of paper. Some of young people already go soul winning every week and young fishermen, you sign up. Adults, some of you need to. To go soul winning every single week. See, I'm responsible for my labor. You're responsible for your labor. Would you commit? Would you follow the Lord? Lord, bless this invitation. Lord, may you have your way and your will. May we be obedient to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Would you stand